Now, let me uh, elucidate just a bit on what the flesh is, just to refresh our memories. The flesh is a word that is used in place of the old nature, okay, the old man. So the old man or the old woman was crucified, if you're a Christian, was crucified with Christ. The old man was. Okay? Now, even though the old man was crucified with Christ, all your sins were laid on Jesus, positionally you stand sinless. Positionally. Now let me explain that. Positionally is how God views us in Christ. Okay? That means when Christ said it is finished on the cross, that's exactly what He meant. And what He meant by that is that He took all of our sins upon Himself and made payment to the Father. Okay? He took the penalty that you and I would have incurred upon Himself. He, he drank the cup of wrath, didn't He? The cup of wrath. You remember, hang on John, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and He was praying, Father, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but whose be done? Thine be done, right? Not my will, thine be done. Isn't that what he said? Well, he went ahead and went to the cross, didn't he? And he allowed himself to be crucified, didn't he? He, he, he didn't have to go. He could have walked away. He, he didn't have to go to Calvary, did he? No, but in order to fulfill Scripture, he went. Because it was forewritten of him to go, wasn't it? All the way back in the book of uh, Genesis, it says in chapter 3, hang on, John, hold your, hold your comment or question till after the, I'm through, okay? In Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, God says to the serpent, You will bruise his heel. Whose heel? Christ's heel. The seed of the woman. That's Christ. But he, Christ, will bruise your head. You say, well, when did he do that? Well, that happened on the cross, didn't it? Yeah. On the cross, Satan bruised Christ's heel, didn't he? By driving those nails through his heel. But Jesus bruised Satan's head, didn't he? Because he took the keys of death from his hand, didn't he? Yeah, so it's very important that you understand where you stand in Christ. You stand complete. Okay? When, when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then God, He takes you, the old you, and He nailed Him to the cross 2,000 years ago. He did this 2,000 years ago. Uh, all your sins get nailed to Christ. Now, you rise again, don't you? Because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, did he? He did not have to, did he? No. But he got up on the third day, didn't he? He got up on the third day. Now, when he got up, we got up. But it wasn't the old man that got up. It was the new man. 
So we have two natures as a Christian. You have the old nature and the new. Now you have to consider the old nature crucified with Christ. You don't obey it anymore. You don't have to obey it. Okay? Now your flesh, your old nature will make you think, or try to make you think, you have to obey Him. But you don't. He, he's trying to deceive you. So now I want you to get angry. It's time to get angry. Leroy, and Leroy says, okay, uh, let's get angry. I well, said, now George, it's, it's time to get, get frustrated and upset. And George says, well, I don't know, I've got a new nature. And I don't have to obey you. So George says, no, I'm not going to do it. So Tom back there, Tom, he, he, he says, well, Tom, you don't need to study your Bible today. Because uh, you just got other things to do, right? That's what the old nature says. But the new man says, no, I believe I do need to study. Because the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Amen? So the new man overcomes. The new man in Christ. Are you following me? We got the old man and the new man. In one body. There's two natures. One, one half of me wants to go the wrong way. The other half wants to go the right way. Okay? And you say, well, who's going to win? Well, whoever you yield to. <laughs> if you yield to the old man, then the old man is going to get the victory. But if you yield... To Jesus, then the new man will get the victory. Understand? That's what it means. Not my will, not be done. Now, the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those first four are sexual sins, aren't they? And we already dealt with those. I'm not going to go over them again. But those are the first four. Now, we are in the second set, which is idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. You think, wow, man. How, how are we ever going to get through all these works of the flesh? It, it, that's not even, not, that's not even the, all of them. There's more that comes after that. But today, we're going to look at maybe one or two of these. I want to look at this, uh, this word sedition. Okay, sedition is a... Uh, a noun, and it means to conduct or speech uh, inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. So it says that Barabbas, he was accused uh, of sedition, wasn't he? Barabbas, he was the one that they released. Yes. Instead of Jesus, they said, give us Barabbas, didn't they? Barabbas was not only a murderer, but he was also a, 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 a sedition. He was a, he was a, a what you might call it, a, he was trying to, to overthrow the Roman government. He was accused of sedition and murder. And he was a very evil man that he didn't like to have anybody uh, tell him what to do, you know. That's what the prison systems are filled with. He, Barabbas. Yes. That was the one that they let go instead of Jesus. He was a criminal. He was going to get crucified.
but because it was the Passover, uh, it was the custom to release one uh, prisoner. And Pontius Pilate tried to get them to release Jesus, but the Jews wouldn't have it, would they? They said, no, give us Barabbas. And they said, let, let Jesus' blood be on us. And it still is, isn't it? 2,000 years later, and they are still, as a nation, rejecting Jesus Christ, aren't they? For 2,000 years, they, 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 they just won't, uh, they won't have Him to be Lord. They say, we have Moses, and we have Abraham. Yeah, but the problem is, Moses and Abraham are not the Savior. <laughs> you might have the law, but the law cannot save you. Okay? All the law can do is tell you what to do and what not to do. But it cannot save you. Amen? Amen. Okay. And so now we're looking at the sedition. Sedition is overt conduct such as speech and organization that tends toward insurrection against the established order. Sedition often includes subversion of a constitution or incitement of discontent toward or resistance against established authority. You know, most people in prison do not like authority. Okay? The first thing they, they do when they get out is they want to do things their way. <laughs> because they've been told how to do things for so many years of being locked up and the first thing they want to do when they get out is be completely free, right? No law, no more, don't tell me what to do. Well, that is kind of, that's a form of sedition, isn't it? And occasionally there'll be prison riots. Well, they'll try to overtake the prison, won't they? Yeah, and then people will get hurt and killed in there. And that's a dangerous place to work. You know, I've been in. Not locked up, thank God, but I've been in uh, prisons before, and they're kind of scary places to be, you know. There's a lot of evil uh, men and women in there, and if they were not locked up, uh, they would be hurting people, right? So that's why they have to be locked up. But at any rate, my point is, uh, when we resist the... The government, the established authority, and then we are being uh, seditious, right? We're being seditious. We, we are trying to overthrow what God has allowed to be established, and we shouldn't do that. Now, if you remember when Lucifer was in heaven, before he got kicked out, he tried to insurrect God, didn't he? He tried to overthrow the Lord. He said, no, uh, I know I'm a beautiful angel, but look how beautiful God is. I, I want to be like God. See, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not content with just being an angel. Uh, I, I, I'm not content, Brother uh, George, with just being a citizen. I want to be the president. Right? <laughs> well, he said, you're not qualified. Well, I know I'm not, but some people think they are, and they're not. So they say, hey, I'm President Trump. We don't like him. You know, we don't like what he's doing. Well, that's your choice, but you should, you should not speak evil. Of your ruler is what the Bible says. You don't speak evil of the president. That's what God says in His Word. 
And if you do, then you are, you are in fact speaking against the Word of God. And God said, don't do that. Right? God puts in position whoever He wants. That's the name. President Trump did not get there on his own, right, without God's permission. God put him there. And in fact, I pray for him, man. I try to pray for him every night, and you should too, because he's our president. He's our leader, right? We shouldn't be throwing uh, mud balls at him. You know, that's the thing I don't like about social media, Facebook and stuff. Everybody wants to get on there and bomb blast uh, the president. Say, now this may be America, but that does not give you the right to do that because God says no. Right? And you don't speak evil about your ruler. Right? You pray for it. You know, speaking evil about somebody, does that do any good, George? No. No. All that does is start fights, it? and we're not to do that. We are called the children of peace. Right, Brother John? Peace. We're not fight. We're not combative. We we don't we don't fight. No, Christians are not to be fighting uh, physically. You know, maybe self defense. Self defense is okay. But you don't go looking for a fight if you're a Christian. Uh, what you do is you fight in the spiritual world. Amen? You fight in the spiritual world. Ephesians, uh, here, let me see, let me read this to you. Ephesians uh, chapter 6 and verse 12, it says this, For we wrestle... Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against other people. We wrestle, we fight against spirits. Amen. Because what is in you and what is in me is a spirit, right? It's a soul, a, a spirit, and that's what our battle is against. Uh, but not just in people, there are demons, and there is the devil who is out there too. And they are trying to disrupt things for the children of God. At any rate, we need to be obedient to those who are in authority above us and not resist them. Let me read another verse to you concerning this and found in uh, the book of Timothy. Okay. And 2 Timothy. Actually, let's see here. 2 Timothy. And it's dealing with this very thing. Okay, it says here in, uh, where we go, submit yourself to every authority uh, of man, to every ordinance of man, for those that be are of God, unto kings as supreme, and governors as those yeah. sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers. For so is the will of God that ye put to silence by well-doing the mouths of foolish men. Right? You put them to silence. Why? You know, you can, you can put the world to silence just by being obedient to Caesar, can't you? By being obedient to the laws of the land. Now, he ain't got nothing on me. I, I'm being obedient to what they uh, are asking of me, right? Well, that's how we need to be. For those who are in authority above us, we need to submit ourselves. Okay? So that is uh, seditions. Now, we're going to look here at another word 
And the word here is heresies. Okay? Heresy is defined, it's another noun, and it is defined as a belief or opinion contrary to orthodox uh, religion, especially Christian doctrine. So heresy is anything that is not according to the Word of God. Amen. Is anything is some it's a heresy is a uh, term that has been acquired uh, in, an, in the ecclesiastical world, meaning let's say the uh, the Mormons, for example, they deny that Jesus is God. Okay? That's heresy. Because anyone who denies that Jesus is God is denying the Word of God. Because the, the Word of God says that Jesus is God. Doesn't it? Not just in one place, but in many. That's not true. So therefore, it is heresy. Okay? There are many... Uh, religions that are heretical okay, and, and heresy. Now, let me just define a couple. The Mormons we already spoke of, and then you have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They too are heretical because they too deny that Jesus as God, and there's many other false doctrines that they hold to. Uh, now, the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> Brian, I know you're with us today. I don't want you to get upset, but they do hold to certain doctrines uh, that are in contradiction to the Bible. Uh, one of them, of course, is the doctrine of purgatory. And it's just not found in, the, in this book, in the Bible. It's in the Apocrypha is where they gather that material. But the problem with it is the Apocrypha was not canonized by the church. In fact, the word Apocrypha literally means false. <laughs> it means false books. So there's 13. And then, of course, the doctrine of Mary, where they esteem... Mary as being uh, co-matrix or equal with Christ. And they, they hold her as being born without sin. That's why they call the Immaculate Conception. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that Mary, she came from uh, a normal mom and dad, a regular mom and dad. Okay? She was not conceived by the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus was, right? So that makes Mary a sinner because she was born by regular human being parents, okay? So there's no way that she could ever be sinless because she inherited sin from her parents, didn't she? Yeah. Jesus, on the other hand, he only had a mother but not a father, right? He... He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so, therefore, we should never pray uh, to Mary or to any saints or, or anybody else other than God. Right? If you pray to anybody other than God, then that is idolatry. Okay? God only will have you and I to pray to Him. Amen? When you pray to someone or something, you are worshiping them, aren't you? You are, you are bowing down and you're saying, uh, could you please help me uh, do this or do that? Or, Forgive me of my sins. Well, that's okay uh, if you need help. You just ask somebody for help. But it's not okay when you, when you bow down uh, in prayer and you, you beseech 
someone other than God for help. Amen. That's not okay. God says in His Word that you are to look unto Him and to Him only. There is one God and one mediator, is what the book of Hebrews says, one mediator between God and man. And do you know who that is, Leroy? Who's the mediator? Amen. Jesus. The one mediator. I say, what's a mediator? Well, a mediator is someone who stands in between you and God, the Father. There's one mediator. That's Jesus. Okay? Mediator. You know, it's a legal term. They use that in, in law. Uh, mediation. You see, when, they're, when you have mediation, that means you go uh, to the judge and you have your, your, your attorney. Uh, he's, he's your mediator. Okay? He stands in between you and the judge. You don't want to go directly to the judge. Because you don't know the law. Right? You're going to look pretty dumb when you go before the judge. Now, the judge says, who's representing you? Just myself. Uh, have you been to law school? No, but I, I think I can handle my own. Okay. Well, I think it's going to be a long day, Brother Leroy. Oh, yeah. Because unless you have been skilled in the law, you don't know what you're talking about, do you? He <laughs> said, I, I object. Well, what do you object to? No, I don't know. I just object. <laughs> right? Well, that sounds kind of silly. And you don't even know what objecting means. Okay. So that is heresy. Heresy is going outside of the Word of God. Let me read to you Revelation in chapter uh, 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. It says here that in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, that's, if any man shall add unto this book, these things, listen, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, that don't sound like a very good deal, does it? I don't think I want to be adding to the Bible. Do you? If you do, then God's going to add the plagues to you. You know, you mess with my word, I'm going to mess you up. Right? And he does. Everybody who trifles with the word of God, God messes them up. Doesn't he? Yes. If any man shall take away, verse 19, from the words of the book of this prophecy, guess what happened? God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You don't get nothing. If you subtract from the word of God and say, no, Jesus ain't God. Or, you know, no, Jesus ain't the only way. Yeah. Uh, well, guess what? You lost everything. Yeah. You, you're going to hell. That's what's going to happen to you. God takes His Word very seriously, doesn't He? And you and I need to take it seriously. We should never trifle. I like that word, trifle. You like that? Trifle? Trifle means to tamper. Right? Don't tamper. You know, when you tamper with something, you, you start fiddling around with it, right? Remember when you were a child, your mother said, now don't tamper with that, Brian. Right? Now you're going you're gonna to get grounded if you tamper with that toy one more time. Hang on, Joe. Hang on. So, we don't want to trifle with the Word of God, do we? No. And you don't want to tamper with it. You want to let it say what it says, don't we? Because when we go overboard, Brother George, and we start saying things that ain't in the Bible, uh-oh, guess what? That takes us back to Revelation 22. And it says when we start messing with it, God is going to take 
us out of the holy city and from the things that are written in it. Not only is he going to take us out, but he's going to he's going to add plagues unto us. It's not a good deal, is it? No, we don't want to be tampering with the word of God. Now that, back to my point, is coming from the flesh. The flesh likes to tamper and trifle uh, with the Word of God. See? Uh, it's not the spirit, it's not the new man that wants to uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to tamper with uh, or to to uh, what should I say? Distort the word of God. The new man, hang on, John. The new man doesn't do that. It's the old man, isn't it? It's the old man that doesn't want to obey the word of God. Not only does he not want to obey, but he wants to change it all together, doesn't he? Right. No, I don't like that chapter. I don't like that that verse. I don't like that. You know, you remember Thomas Jefferson? He was one of our presidents. Sir. And Thomas Jefferson. Third. Has. Third. Yes. Third. Oh, the third. Thomas Jefferson the third. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, he. He had a problem with the Bible, and you know what he did? Anything that he didn't agree with, all the miracles, he didn't believe in the miracles of Jesus. So you know what he did? He took his little pair of scissors and he cut out all the miracles that Jesus did, and he reduced him to a mere man. And you don't do that, do you? Thomas Jefferson, by the way, was a mason. It kind of explains things. Because Masons have a way of tampering with God's Word, don't they? Well, we're not going to tamper with God's Word. We're going to let the Word of God say what it says. And we'll grow from it. Now, we made it to verse 21. Can you believe it? Brother John, Tom, hey... We made it to 21. Yes, we, we've been in this this uh, this chapter. How long have we been in chapter 5, Mayor John? Huh? Jesus' mother Mary, she was not a holy woman. She was a regular woman. She was a regular woman, just like your mom or mine. Now, she was a godly woman. Don't get me wrong. She was very godly because God would not choose... Uh, you know, just some, some, some raggedy old lady that, that didn't respect his word. God was not going to choose that to be the mother to give birth and raise his son. But to answer your question, she was not holy. She was a sinner, just like you and me. But she got saved, didn't she? Yeah. She was at the foot of the cross. And Jesus, she was right there looking up at, at her son and Jesus and Jesus said he looked down at her and you know who there who was with her the John the disciple John the one whom Jesus loved he was right there and uh, he said John behold your mother because evidently Joseph had died his dad his his his, uh, his adopted dad uh, had died at some point, we don't know how or from what, but Jesus says, now John, I want you to take care of my mom, right? So John took her in to his home and took care of her, uh, because back then, you know, uh, yes, you too, uh, back then, it was a very difficult thing to be a single woman in that society. Uh, you, you know, you had to be pretty smart and pretty industrious in order to survive as a single woman in that day and age back then. And uh, Mary was not that type. She was a homebody. She liked to stay at home. She's more holy than a lot of Hang on, John. 
And uh, so, at any rate, let's look at verse 21. The next word here is envying. Envying. Do you know what that means? Envying? Envying. What does it mean to envy someone? Jealous. Yes, that's part of it. To be jealous. 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 And, and was it, who was envious in heaven? Jesus Christ. No. God. Lucifer. He envied God, didn't he? He was jealous of God. He wanted to be God. Yes. He wanted to be above God. Lucifer was jealous of God. Yeah, of Jesus. Jesus, however, he was not in a physical body at that time. Uh, he was, the, he is the Word, he was in a spiritual body. Do you know that Jesus Christ is in a real physical body right now in heaven? He is seated at the right hand of God the Father, way up there, past the the cloud, past the moon, and past the stars. He's in the third heaven. The third heaven. You know what? The, the first heaven is the blue sky. The second heaven is the outer space. And the third heaven, that's where the Lord is. Okay? Nobody can get up there. Hang on, John. Hold your comments till after a minute. Nobody can, they can't build a spaceship that makes it to the third heaven, can they, Brother Tom? No, it's just too high, right? It's too high. But the Apostle Paul, he, he was carried up into the third heaven, wasn't he? He had a vision. That's where he received direct revelation from Jesus himself was up in Jesus' home in heaven. The third heaven. Hang on, John. Okay, now, back to our uh, term, envying. The works of the flesh, envying. When I'm envying somebody, that means that, how should I say this? I am not uh, content with them having something and me not having it. Okay? I say, now you've got a nice suit on and I'm envying you. <laughs> I shouldn't do that, should I? Because if I envy you, that means I want something that you have. I don't want you to have it no longer. I want it. That's envy. Okay, envy, and it does involve jealousy. Uh, envy, okay, it, uh, yes, envy is a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or whatnot. Uh, okay, so what it means here is that you are resentful, you say, now Leroy, now I like that watch, uh, that watch you got on Leroy, yeah. and uh, I don't think you should have it, okay? Uh, it's making me upset, you want it, because you have that nice watch and I don't, okay? And I'm going to physically remove it from you in order for me to satisfy my envy. Right? That's envy. When you when it gets down into you, say, now, now my let's say there's a married couple, and the husband is the breadwinner. Yeah. And he's bringing home all kinds of money, right? And the wife says, now, honey, I'd like to do some shopping this weekend, and he says, no, uh, uh, you did your shopping last weekend. And, and just not going to happen this weekend because I'm watching the funds. And she says, wait a second. And I know you got money 
and I want some of that. I gotta go buy me a new pair of shoes. I want them shoes at Dillard's. You got the money, and you're gonna give it to me. And he says, No, I'm not. And she says, Oh yeah. Well, you see this gun? <laughs> I'm gonna shoot you. So she shoots him and then takes his wallet and says, I'm going because I'm envious of what you have, right? You know, a lot of wars are started because of envy, aren't they? They say, you got oil over there and we want some of that oil, right? <laughs> We're going to come get it, whether you like it or not. People fertilize a lot of houses because of envy. Yes, they, they, People get killed over envy. See, they say, boy, that's a nice car he's driving. I think I'd like to have that. And they walk up to the person in the car and shoot them. And then they drag their body out of the car and now it's my car. That's not very nice, is it? Uh, that, in fact, that's murder. <laughs> right? You don't, but listen, let me read you something back here in Genesis. This should make it clear, okay? Because here is the first recorded incident in the Bible of envy. It comes from Genesis chapter 4. And it says, Now in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Okay, Cain. Cain was the first child born from Adam and Eve, wasn't he? Right? They had him after the fall. Okay? Eve did not get pregnant until after the fall. Adam did not sleep with her. At least she, she did not conceive until after the fall. And Cain, the fall was in chapter 3. And now we're in chapter 4. So Cain had brought an offering uh, of the fruit of the ground. You know, Cain was a farmer. Okay? He tilled the ground. He, nothing wrong with that. What he was doing, it, it was legitimate. Legitimate work, wasn't it? He was a farmer. You can't hold anything against him for that. But he brought of the fruit of the ground unto the Lord. Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord, it says, had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very raw, and his countenance fell. So Cain got upset, didn't he? Cain said, hey, wait a second, I don't know how the Lord, if the Lord, if he audibly told, uh, you know, Cain, uh, I, I don't respect your offering, but Abel, I do yours. Or if it was something internal that was going on and Cain, Cain saw the Lord blessing Abel, and, he, and oh, maybe all of Cain's crops died, you know. And Cain says, well, the Lord's against me. You know, all my crops have died. He's not respecting, he's not respecting my offering. We don't know what happened, but we do know that the Lord respected Abel's offering and not Cain's. Now let's look what happened. Let's see what happened. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you wroth? And why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, if you do the right thing, I'll receive you. And if you do not well, then sin lieth at the door. You say, what does that mean? <laughs> sin lieth at the door. Well, that is a figure of speech. And it means that sin and the guilt that goes with sin is going to be on your conscience. It's lying on the door, right? And you're not going to be able to get rid of it. 
but let, let's see. And unto thee, God says, unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay, now it says, Cain talked with Abel his brother. He had a little meeting, right? He knew that, that what he, his offering was no good. He, he, he knew the Lord was not pleased with him. So he, he, he talked with Abel, and it says that it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. That's the first act of murder in the Bible. And it was terrible because it was the firstborn killing the secondborn. Isn't that terrible? He killed his brother. Why? Because he envied his offering. He said, he, his problem was that Abel didn't do anything to Cain, did he? He didn't say nothing bad to him. No. Abel, he just brought him the offering. He made his regular offering, didn't he? He put his, his lamb down, and Cain did his, but God didn't, didn't respect his offering. Maybe God burned up uh, Abel's offering. He sent fire down, and he, he burned Abel's, but Cain's offering, he didn't burn it up. Right. Maybe that's what happened. We don't know for sure, but at any rate, Cain's problem was with God, wasn't it? Yeah. But he took it out on Abel, didn't he? He said, he said, now I can't kill God, but I can kill the one who God loves. And that's what he did, didn't he? Because he envied. Do you know why they crucified Jesus? One reason why? Because they envied Him. Didn't they? They, they envied Him. They said, there's a man who, who knows the Bible better than us. He, he can do miracles. He can raise the dead, heal the sick. Cast out demons. Let Jesus Christ. Yes. And we can't do that. And all the people are going after him. And he's destroying our religion. We're losing money. The offering is going down. <laughs> Jesus is taking all our members and he's taking them out there to the mountainside and having church out in the open air. Right. Right? They're following him everywhere. We ain't got no money. We're broke. Right? We're gonna kill him. Right? Well, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He he never said anything bad to the the those religious people. Now he let them know that their form of religion was wrong. That that it was not from God. He let them know that, didn't he? He, he, he kicked the, the people out of the temple because they were selling stuff in there, right. didn't he? He threw, overthrew the money changers' table. Right. He kicked. He, he made a he made a bull whip yeah. and he whipped them out. He said, "Get out of my father's house." Well, they killed Jesus. Not only because he made himself out to be God, but because they were envious of him. They envied him. Okay? And whenever you envy someone, you're not going to like them too well, are you? You're going to say, I know you're blessed. I, I know you, you're gifted. But I don't think you should have that. Right? That's what the devil does, doesn't it? The devil, he looks at God's children. You know, first of all, the devil hates God, doesn't he? You think, why does God even allow the devil to exist? You know, God could just wipe him, clean his clock, wipe him off the face of the earth, just like that, couldn't he? Hang on. 
but he doesn't. He allows him to operate and do the evil things that he does. Why? Well, St. Augustine put it this way. God allows the wicked of this world to perfect the faith of the elect. In other words, God, God allows the wicked to persecute the righteous in order to make us more like Christ. Because without persecution, there's no test of your faith, is there? There's no test. Right. Let me read you a quote here uh, from, uh, I've got it, hang on, in my notes, Brother Calvin, he says here that, uh, though, he says here that, indeed, we, we do not truly and perfectly obey God unless we implicitly follow whatever He commands. Though our feelings may be opposed to it, there is always the best reason, no doubt, for everything that God does. But He often conceals it from us for a time in order to instruct us not to be wise in ourselves, but to depend entirely on the expression of His will. Well said, isn't it? <laughs> That's by Brother John Calvin. Now, we need to just be content with God, don't we? We need to not get upset when things don't go our way. We need to be okay with whatever God has for us. And that's not always easy, is it? No. Because we always want something a little bit better, don't we? I don't know. When, when you got pain in the body, say, boy, if I could just get rid of this burden, right, Brother Leroy? Right. Then, man, I'd feel better. But you know, God says, you're going to have to endure it a little bit longer. Yeah. Right? He said, because I'm the one that's giving it to you. I'm allowing you to have the pain. Uh, it, it's for your good, believe it or not. Leroy said, how could this be for my good? I'm burning up. Well, I, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And one thing He uses is pain, doesn't He? When we got pain in our bodies, God tests us, doesn't He? He said, are you going to turn to me? Or are you going to turn against me? Well, we need to always turn to the Lord, don't we? Let's turn to God in everything. Let's not be upset. Let's don't be envy people. Let's don't be seditious or strife or wrath or emulations or variance or hatred, idolatry. Let's don't do any of that. Instead, let's just focus on the Lord. Amen? Let's keep our minds on the Lord. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And next time, we'll, we'll pick it up in uh, verse 21 again. We've got a few more left. And then, believe it or not, once we get out of verse 21, we're going to get into the good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. That's coming in verse 22. All right? You say, man, preacher, you're killing me with all this negativity, with all this bad stuff. Well, I have to tell you all these things because that's what the flesh does. Right? It's all coming from the flesh. It's not coming from the new man. It's coming from the old man, isn't it? Let me read just one last portion, and then I'm going to pray, because this is going to help you here. 
It says here in uh, Romans in, in chapter 7, hang on, Romans chapter 7, and let me read verse uh, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do not, for that which I do, I allow none. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. <laughs> you think, what is it? What, what kind of poetic uh, uh, speech are you using, Pastor? Well, I didn't write the book. God did. He says, Paul saying, I, I'm not doing the things I want to do, and I'm doing the things I don't want to do. What's going on? If then I do that which I would not, I can sin unto the law, it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You understand that? For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform it, that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, the evil that I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That, my brothers, is called the law of sin. The law of sin. It keeps dragging you back. You say, man, I thought I got rid of that cussing. And here I go again. Well, that's the law of sin. It, it, it's still, you're still dealing with it. Okay? I thought I got rid of that lust. What am I doing looking at that again? No, that's the law of sin. You know, it, it takes time, doesn't it? It takes time to overcome the law of sin. And only the Holy Spirit can do it. You can't do it on your own, Brother Brian. And neither can I. God has to do it in us, doesn't he? He, he has to do His work in and through us. Amen? Unless the Lord build the house, they that build labor in vain. How many times have I said that, Brother, brother Tom? A hundred? <laughs> so that's my favorite verse in the Bible, ain't it? Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord build the house, they that build labor in vain. You know, ain't that the worst than laboring in vain? <laughs> you build a, you know, you spend all day working on something, then a strong wind comes and blows it all down. And you say, man, that was a waste. That's vanity, isn't it? Well, I don't want my stuff to be blown down. I want my stuff to stand. Amen? All right. I know you do too. So let's go to God and close a word of prayer. And then you guys can go eat your dinner. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you once again for your holy and righteous word, for teaching us the truths of your word, the works of the flesh. Lord, we pray and ask for grace and strength not to obey the flesh, but to obey you, your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, praying for us and giving us the victory. We thank you for all that you have done. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for choosing us and for redeeming us from the curse of the law, which is eternal death and hell, and giving us everlasting life in the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay.